Welcome to this seminar, our fourth and final seminar of the convention. Uh, Ted Whitey is our educational director who coordinates the seminar speakers. And about now, you've probably heard this already, some of you, he's enjoying reindeer over in Finland. And uh, I didn't know they ate reindeer, but I guess they do. <clears throat> he works for resorts, uh, resorts oh, oh, nobody, <coughs> I need to change that. He, he works for MGM Resorts International in their surveillance department, and he's in charge of all of it. And so MGM decided to send him on some projects uh, in that part of the world. And so he called me and said, Jim, I can't host the seminar speakers, so can you fill in? So I said yes to be able to just stand here and say, I haven't really met these people very much to know what they do, but I have had heard of, uh, of this lady in the past uh, because she has a couple books out on the market. And uh, I you have them for sale, right? Yes, here? the family you know, yeah. yep. Okay, so with no further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Lynn Zook. Thank you all for coming this afternoon. And we apologize again for the gremlins in the system, but it happens. You also have to bear with me. I'm getting old. I used to be able to remember all this information in my head just a few years ago. And then I got old. I can't, so I have notes. Occasionally, I will have to read from the notes. Because Betty Davis is right, getting old is not for sissies. Actually, it kind of sucks. But, anyways, this presentation is on a few of the early strip visionaries. So let's get started. It all begins with a myth. The myth is that Tommy Hall's car broke down on his way to town. While he waited for the tow truck, he counted the number of cars that were inbound to Las Vegas. By the time the tow truck showed up, Tommy Hall had decided that building a hotel in the desolate desert around him was a surefire moneymaker. But as I said, that's a myth. In reality, Tommy Hall was a successful hotelier in Southern California. He had read a highway engineering report that said a million cars a year traveled between Southern California and Las Vegas. I don't know what they were smoking when they read that report because this would have been the late 1930s, but a million cars nonetheless. That was enough to convince Hall that he should Open a he should build a hotel in Las Vegas where gaming was legal. Remember, all around the rest of the country, outside of the state of Nevada, gaming is illegal. But in the state of Nevada, in Las Vegas, very legal. So, he decides he's going to build his hotel here in Las Vegas. He comes to town quite often, and he becomes good friends with this man. City extraordinaire, Big Jim Cashman. You've heard of Cashman Cadillac, you've heard of Big Jim Cashman. Huh. One night at the Hotel Apache Bar, they're having drinks, and Big Jim tries to convince Tommy Hall that he needs to build his hotel on Fremont Street. But Fremont Street is within city limits, so that means taxes, and also, too, land is more expensive. So Tommy Hall decides to keep looking. He finds 57 acres for sale near the intersection of Highway 91, the old LA freeway, and San Francisco Street. He finds that means the land is in the county, which means fewer taxes. So Tommy Hall likes that idea. So he uh, contacts Jesse Hunt, who owns the 57 acres, and agrees to buy the land from her for $57,000. Not a bad deal. He commissioned his friend, architect Wayne McAllister, 
build the hotel. But investors wouldn't take the risk. He found a private loan from Texas, and Paul was off and running. He knew the template of luxuries, a luxury hotel would not necessarily be a hit with locals who were more accustomed to Western things, because this is Las Vegas. Therefore, McAllister designed the interior in the local Western style. He had wagon wheel chandeliers hanging from the ceilings, and he draped curtains from poles with cattle horns. The publicity brochure stated, dress informal, bring your Westerns. Yeah, right. But the hotel had modern amenities. Paul had the pool built next to the hotel, so you could see it from the, from the highway. He reasoned that the hot travelers, weary from the long, hot drive in from Southern California, would see the pool, see the people around the pool, and decide, we're staying there. Because who wouldn't? But uh, let's see. He had invented the perfect casino complex. The large lot enabled him to include a whole range of facilities that the downtown casinos could only dream of, including a swimming pool, a parking lot, a dining room, a showroom, a coffee shop, a travel agency, badminton courts, and even riding stables with 15 horses. With a range of resort facilities at their convenience, guests would never need to leave the premises. By including the hotel, Paul's Casino had a captive audience. The Las Vegas Strip would grow. And look at all that desert. <laughs> yeah. And that brings us to our next. By now, everyone has heard the myth. Benjamin Siegel, looking a great deal like movie star Warren Beatty, <laughs> drives up a dusty highway into downtown Las Vegas. Not liking the dust, not liking the desert rats drinking at the bar, not liking the frontier architecture, he gets in his car and heads back, out of town. He pulls off the dusty, empty highway and has a fever dream. He announces to Virginia Hill, his driving companion, who looks a great deal like actress Annette Benning, <laughs> that here is where he will build his, the world's greatest hotel, the fabulous Flamingo. It's a pivotal moment in the movie Bugsy, but in reality, <clears throat> it is a map of so much of Las Vegas history. True, the El Rancho Vegas <laughs> and the Hotel Last Frontier were both doing very good business on that same stretch of dusty, empty highway. More so, this man, Billy Wilkerson, was already, the Flamingo was already under construction by the time Siegel joined the party. The hotel was the brainchild of Billy Wilkerson, who was a Hollywood entrepreneur, or a Hollywood publisher and a nightclub entrepreneur. He owned the Hollywood Reporter, and he owned nightclubs such as Ciro's, and Trocadero that cater to the Hollywood crowd, which you're going to hear a whole lot about. He also had a wicked gaming habit. Two of his friends, millionaire playboy Howard Hughes and movie mogul Nick Skink, suggested that Wilkerson own his own casino so he could own the house. He saw the potential of what would become the Las Vegas Strip, and wanting to be different from the other two hotels, he proposed a resort hotel that would draw off the Hollywood crowd that he knew so well. It would be a sophisticated carpet joint where the stars would come to play, gamble, <coughs> and have a really good time. In 1945, Wilkerson purchased 33 acres of property on the east side of Highway 90. Remember that the El Rancho Vegas and the Hotel Last Frontier are on the west side of, of the highway. So, Wilkerson's thinking was he wanted his hotel on the east side of the freeway and a little further down 
so that his hotel would be the first one that tourists from Southern California would see. He envisioned a casino, a Parisian-themed showroom, a nightclub, an athletic club, steam rooms, hotel rooms, and an award-winning restaurant with European chefs. He also had a really good idea that the whole place would be air-conditioned. Smart man. He wanted to break with the Western theme of both the other two resorts and the casinos on Fremont Street. Wilkerson wanted a swanky place that would be considered classy and high-end for his high-end friends and gamblers. He was upping the ante to glitz and swank in a way that neither tourists or locals had, had seen. With a budget of $1.2 million, construction began in November 1945. Wilkerson had a loan of $600,000 from Bank of America and another $200,000 from his buddy, Howard Hughes. Wilkerson took the plane crafts in an attempt to win the rest of the money that he needed to build his dream hotel. Unfortunately, Lady Luck was not riding with Billy Wilkerson that night, and he ended up losing more than $200,000. Oopsie, despondent over the loss, he, some would say foolishly, accepted an offer of more than a million dollars from New York underworld figure <laughs> G. Harry Rothberg. Rothberg's underworld partners included Meyer Lansky, Gus Greenbaum, Mo Sedway, and this guy, Lansky's childhood pal, Benjamin Bugsy Siegel. The partners had moved into Las Vegas, gaining by muscling in on the local race wire downtown. They took the money from, the, from that and quickly bought and sold the El Cortez for $166,000 profit. They'd been keeping an eye on Wilkerson's dream hotel, and when Wilkerson crapped out, they made their move and became silent partners. Wilkerson and Siegel had been friendly since the 1930s, and they'd gotten to know each other in Los Angeles. Siegel was a frequent guest at Wilkerson's clubs. They decided that they could work together, overseeing the daily construction of the resort. Wilkerson knew of Siegel's underworld ties and his reputation. Siegel, of course, moved quickly to take control of the whole operation. Wilkerson agreed, and Richard Stableman, an architect from Los Angeles, was brought in, and Del Webb was hired to be the general contractor. Myth. Siegel named the hotel the Flamingo after Virginia Hill's legs. Truth. Billy Wilkerson loved exotic birds, and he adopted a tall, lanky, pink bird as the logo for his new hotel, the Fabulous Flamingo. <laughs> Resentments began to build. Imagine that. And with Lansky's blessing, Siegel forced Wilkerson to give up creative control of his hotel and only remain as a shareholder. Wilkerson at the time of the architect Wilkerson, at the time, owned 48% of the stock, according to his son, W.R. Wilkerson. Siegel's first move was to turn everything over, all the architectural work, over to Richard Stadelman. And in June 1946, Siegel formed the Nevada Projects Corporation and appointed himself president. <laughs> there was a housing shortage in post-war America, and building materials were scarce and at a premium. Siegel preferred to throw money at the problem. Imagine that. He flew in carpenters and laborers and paid them top dollar. Not happy with the plans, he continued to make changes even after construction had begun. The boiler room and the kitchen both had to be rebuilt because he was unhappy with them. Long-time residents still talk about the profiteering that went on at that hotel. He scaled back the number of rooms to 93 
and wanted separate sewer lines for each room. He often bought material on the black market and paid top dollar for it. Because he kept, oops, sorry, that, that. Because he kept making changes, the project was soon awash in a million dollars worth of overruns. Siegel sold a million dollars of stock in the bad corporations to Lansky, Wilkerson, and anyone that would buy in. Siegel would buy the material and have it delivered, only to have it stolen from the construction site. He would, unwittingly, some believe, buy the material back once the, once the theft had been discovered. Lansky and others came to believe that Siegel was behind the thefts and had more going into Siegel's own back pocket than they did. Siegel finally forced Billy Wilkerson to sign over his stock in the hotel, and Wilkerson fled to Paris. However, Billy Wilkerson did not give up so easily. This is the original facade of the hotel. The point. The Flamingo opened December 26, 1946, featuring a showroom, a lounge, and a restaurant. In the showroom, Jimmy Durante, Xavier Cougat and his orchestra, and singer Rose Marie were the headliners. Despite a winter storm that included rain, thunder, and lightning, some of Siegel's Los Angeles friends braved the elements to board the plane that Siegel had charted for the occasion. The hotel rooms weren't finished yet, so guests had to make accommodations at the other two hotels or downtown. This proved a boom for the other hotels because Flamingo's <coughs> guests would often take their winnings back to the hotel where they were staying and continue gambling. The bad weather forced many of the invited guests to send their regrets. The heralded grand opening that Siegel had so meticulously planned was declared a flop. To make matters worse, the casino lost over $300,000 in the first two weeks to winning gamblers. Oopsie. Wilkerson took out an ad in the Hollywood Reporter flaunting Siegel's cost overruns and irresponsibility. Locals who attended the grand opening went home and told their friends about the opulent hotel where men had to wear jackets or, more preferably, a tuxedo, and women were required to wear evening gowns. For a small community like Las Vegas, where the mindset was still the early West and modern splendor, this was much too formal for them. The high overhead costs of too few customers and the mounting construction costs finally forced Siegel to temporarily close the resort. Siegel planned on reopening the hotel in March of 1947. The hotel rooms were completed without any further interference, and the second opening of the hotel was a success. The Hollywood crowd came to see Ben's new resort, and they liked what they saw. The Flamingo included bingo as a way to lure the locals back. In less than two months, the hotel was showing a profit. However, for Siegel, it was not enough. His investors, tired of seeing an endless money debt, wanted a faster return on their dollars. A private meeting was called in Havana that was overseen by expat mobster Charles Luck Lucky Luciano. When Siegel heard about the meeting, he flew to Havana, met personally with Luciano. Luciano demanded that Siegel start paying the money back. Siegel, enraged, lost his famous temper and walked out. Unknown to Siegel, his mom friends and investors had had enough. A hit was ordered on the charismatic gangster who had come up the hard way with Meyer Lansky on the mean streets of New York City. Siegel was killed June 20th, 1947, while sitting on the sofa in the living room of Virginia Hills Beverly Hills home. Siegel's friend, Al Smiley, sitting across the room, was unharmed. Siegel's companion, Virginia Hill, had conveniently flown to Paris the night before. 
At the same time that Benjamin Siegel was finding out that money means more than blood, to his mob friends, Mo Sedway, Gus Greenbaum, and Morris Rosen were walking into the Flamingos Casino and seizing control of the hotel. When word of Siegel's, mur word of Siegel's murder hit the newsway, newswires, the town of Las Vegas figured prominently in articles written about the monster hotel owner. It was the kind of advertising that the up-and-coming town needed. The fabulous Flamingo was soon showing a $4 million profit under the new managers. Wilkerson and Siegel paved the way for others who wanted to build a new, who wanted to build new sophisticated hotels and casinos in what was quickly becoming the hottest strip of land in the Southwest. But in some ways, Siegel had the last laugh. A few years ago, television newscaster Diane Sawyer called him the man who built Las Vegas, which must have come as a surprise to the people that had been living here since the 1900s. <laughs> Today, various books, magazines, and newspaper articles all link Siegel to the post-war future of Las Vegas. While Siegel met an untimely death, Billy Wilkerson lived out his life in Los Angeles, no doubt happy to get out with his life. Seventy-seven years later, the Flamingo Hotel is still going strong and is one of the last original hotels on the Las Vegas Strip. That takes us to Wilbur Clark. The first hotels on the Las Vegas Strip were known by the Known by their names, the Rancho Vegas, the Hotel Last Frontier, the Fabulous Flamingo, and the Thunderbird. A visionary with an early sense of branding decided that his new hotel would be different. And so Wilbur Clark, Will Clark's Desert Inn was born. The hotel would become world famous even long after Clark had shuffled off this mortal coil. Clark was a shrewd businessman with big dreams. In 1938, he traveled to Las Vegas. He was underwhelmed by the dusty railroad town and what it had to offer. Six years later, however, Las Vegas was in the midst of a boom cycle thanks to World War II. When Clark returned in 1944, the town offered more to those who dreamed big. He immediately recognized the possibilities that Highway 91 had to offer especially with the tourists arriving by car from California. Tommy Paul was looking to get out of the El Rancho Vegas, and Clark got in and became a majority owner. While visiting <coughs> his town Las Vegas, Clark realized that Fremont Street was also moving away from its western roots. The Northern Club was on the south side of Fremont Street, and it caught his eye. In 1931, when gambling had been declared legal, in the state, owner Mamie Stockard had received the first gaming license from the city of Las Vegas. By the time Clark was showing interest in the Northern Club, Stockard was looking to retire, so Clark leased the space and then renamed it the Monte Carlo Club. But Clark dreamed of designing and owning a major resort on the Las Vegas Strip that would cater to high rollers and provide the best in entertainment. I swear to God there was something in the water, because you will hear this line over and over and over this afternoon. <laughs> he knew that once the war was over, Americans would want to travel again, especially after the rationing and supporting the war effort. He looked at the oasis in the desert and saw a future that he could help shape to his own vision. His dream resort would become the Desert Inn, in 1945, he bought the land directly across the highway from the last frontier, and in 1946, sold his interest in the El Rancho Vegas for $1.5 million. By 1946, the, the Strip was already showing growing pains. Billy Wilkerson and Benjamin Siegel were building and fighting over the fabulous Flamingo, and Cliff Jones and Marion Hicks were in the planning stages of the Thunderbird. In 1947, construction began on Wilbur Clark's Desert Inn. Clark was soon short of funds. Imagine that. 
due to the high cost of building materials and construction costs in the post-war era. Wilkerson and Siegel, as you know, had the same problem, but Siegel was able to talk his East Coast buds, such as Meyer Lansky and others, into footing the bill. Hicks and Jones had decided to delay the construction on their hotel until the cost of building materials stabilized. Clark was forced to stop construction and the partially, partially built resort set vacant and incomplete. Locals would ride their horses out there to see if Clark had gotten lucky and construction had started up again. Clark's folly in the desert soon became the butt of jokes told around town. Clark soon realized that his dream was not going to become a reality without some help. He approached Mo Dalet and a group of investors. They were all from Cleveland, part of the Mayfield Road Gang, and every one of them had bootlegging and gambling experience. Clark sold them a 75% interest in, his in return for the funds to finish the hotel. Construction finally started back up in 1949. The fanciful neon sign was designed by Yesco's Herman Bernsche. It featured a saguaro cactus, which is not native to southern Nevada, but it is grown in Arizona. But it was such a pretty cactus, recalled <laughs> architect Hugh Taylor. <coughs> Taylor and Clark traveled the country to different resorts to get ideas. Dalitz insisted that they go to Cincinnati to see how a real casino operated. The Beverly Hills Club catered to the well-heeled crowd and offered a spacious dining room, a lavish showroom, and a casino. In Cincinnati, the casino had to be well hidden because gambling was illegal, and in Las Vegas, the casino could be front and center. Hugh Taylor, constantly taking notes, took the ideas that Clark and Dalitz wanted most and incorporated them into the design features of the DI. In doing so, he raised the bar even higher than Siegel had with the fabulous Flamingo. Clark may not have owned a controlling interest in the hotel any longer, but he, in, he was determined to have his name attached to the hotel. At the street entrance was an old-fashioned ranch sign that read, Wilbur Clark's Desert Inn. Will Clark was a tireless ambassador, not only for the hotel that bore his name, but for the city of Las Vegas as well. From his second story office that overlooked the pool and, the, and just below the sky room, Clark publicized his love, not only for his hotel, but his hometown as well. On, in, on the radio, in newspapers, magazines, and on television, Wilbur and Tony Clark became one of the premier couples in town. Invitations to their home for dinner or drinks were some of the most sought after. After years of living in a small hotel while trying to finance his dream resort, Clark pulled out all the stocks when he had his house built on the hotel's golf course. Wilbur Clark and Tony Clark traveled the country and the world promoting Las Vegas and Wilbur Clark's Desert Inn Hotel and Casino. This is a video that unfortunately doesn't play, but it basically tells you what a great ambassador Wilbur Clark was uh, for the city of Las Vegas and for the hotel. In 1956, Wilbur Clark suffered a stroke. It was a harbinger of things to come, and it forced Clark to slow down. Wilbur Clark was being told by his doctors that his poor health was getting the best of him, and he reluctantly retired, and he sold his remaining interest in the hotel to Mo Dalitz and his associates in 1964. Wilbur Clark died of a heart attack August 27, 1965. The outpouring of love and grief was almost immediate. Clark had been responsible for bringing some of the biggest names to Las Vegas, including the Duke and Duchess of Windsor. Lord knows what 
they must have thought of Las Vegas. Clark and his wife had entertained world leaders at the DI over the years. Over a thousand people turned out for his funeral. In 2000, the DI celebrated its 50th anniversary with a week-long celebration. On April 28, 2000, during that celebration, Steve Wynn bought the hotel for $270 million. Wynn and his wife, Elaine, were the only shareholders. Wynn said the resort was a birthday gift to his wife. <laughs> Today, the Wynn and its sister, Hotel Encore, sit on the property that was once the Desert Inn and the Desert Inn Golf Course and Country Club Estates. And that takes us to this man, Milton Prowl in the Swinging Sahara. Milton Prowl was from Butte, Montana. Like many other gambling visionaries of the day, he relocated to the legally more friendly gaming clients of Las Vegas. Though not as well known today as others, such as Wilbur Clark and Del Webb, Prell nonetheless made an impact on Las Vegas. He invested in the Club Bingo. In addition to the bingo parlor, there were a few other games of chance. The Club Bingo had a reputation for its fine food and its bonanza room. There were no hotel rooms, it was just a club. But it did have a small showroom that featured Dorothy Dandridge, comedian Stan Irwin, and the African-American swing group, the Trineers. Milton Prell soon realized the future of the Las Vegas Strip was in having a resort hotel that catered to tourists swarming in from Southern California. That meant financing and building a major hotel. Located on the east side of the highway and directly across the street from the El Rancho Vegas, the Club Bingo had a prime location. In the years ahead, Krell would also build the Lucky Strike and the Met Hotel on Fremont Street. But it was the construction of the Sahara that led to the creation of the Sahara Nevada Corporation which he would ultimately sell to Del Webb. Local air conditioning contractor Al Wild introduced Milton Prell to Del Webb. Prell and Dallas financial wizard A. Pollard Simon agreed to a cost plus arrangement that included a percentage of hotel stuff, 20%, it was learned later, would be given to Webb as partial payment for his services. The Sahara officially opened on October 7, 1952. Milton Prell dubbed the hotel the Jewel of the Desert. Opening night was so successful that the money had to be rushed straight from the cash boxes underneath the tables to the casino cage at a frantic pace so that the guests could continue to cash in their winnings. <laughs> Comedian Stan Irwin was offered the job of entertainment director. Tired of being on the road, Stan Irwin agreed to take the job. Though new to the job, he proved himself adept at booking the best in entertainment, and until the Sands opened and Jack and Trotta began booking the Copa Room, Irwin was holding his own against the other entertainment directors in town. However, Milton Prell decided to hire Bill Miller. Miller, like in Trotta, had his roots back east. He had owned and operated the Riviera Nightclub in Fort Lee, New Jersey. He had booked acts like Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, the Will Maston Trio, and he was also an agent for crooners such as Tony Martin. But a highway was going to be built that would run right through Bill Miller's beloved Riviera Club. About that time, he got a phone call from Las Vegas. We'd love for you to come out and take a piece of this place and be a part of our group, Miller remembered Prell telling him. Miller was named entertainment director in 1953. Miller wanted to reshape lounge entertainment. He believed there was a way to make a lounge not only profitable, but if there was good entertainment late at night, it would help bring more gamblers into the casino. 
The Mary Kay Trio and the Treneers were anchoring the lounge at the El Rancho Vegas, but that was about it for lounge entertainment in those days. Miller had been the agent for a band leader out of New Orleans named Louis Prima. In 1954, Prima called Miller looking for work. How would you like a seven-year deal? Miller asked. Prima wasn't convinced when he heard he, they would be a lounge act. You're going into the lounge, Louie, and you're going to make more money than you ever did. You're just going to live in town. You'll be off the road. You'll be there for seven years. Prima agreed to that. He and Keely Smith moved to Las Vegas just before Christmas. Traditionally, the week between Christmas and New Year's is a slow week in Las Vegas, and their act wasn't really working. Prima was afraid the hotel would cancel the contract if things didn't improve. He made a fateful phone call to an old friend and saxophone player in New Orleans. This is a video where Louis Prima basically called Sam Butera on Christmas Eve and said, hey Sam, how would you like to come to Las Vegas and play with me and Keeley? And Sam said, oh, that sounds good, Louie, when? How about tomorrow? <laughs> and Sam went, uh, Louie, tomorrow's Christmas Day. I got a wife and kids. I can be there on the 26th, but I can't be there tomorrow. And Louie Prima, Louis Prima agreed that Sam Butera and his band would join him on the 26th. The drummer and the piano player barely had time to meet Prima and Smith before taking the stage. Louis Prima introduced Keely Smith, Sam Butera, and the Witnesses. The audience liked that name, and it stuck. The lounge entertainers performed sets between midnight and 6 a.m. every night. They rotated generally with a comedian, so there was always entertainment in the lounge. And this is a video that basically tells you how hot that show was. According to people that were there back in the day, you couldn't even get in the room. It was that jump. And there was no one ever in the history of show business that did the business that this man did from midnight to 6 a.m. in the morning. You could not get into that club. There, that was really one of the biggest things that happened in Las Vegas, according to Bill Miller. It created people like Shecky Green and the lounge era. The, all the lounge acts start with Louis Prima. Prima, Smith, Butera, and the witnesses kept the joint jumping all night long. In 1961, Prell sold the Sahara to Del Webb. Del Webb merged its construction company with the Sahara Nevada Corporation and became the first publicly traded company to have holdings in a Las Vegas gaming establishment. Also included in the deal were the Mint and the Lucky Strike. On February 10, 1964, a testimonial dinner was held to honor Milton Prell. He was retiring as president of the Sahara Nevada Corporation, soon to be renamed the Del Webb Corporation, and moved to Southern California. He would retain the title of chairman of the board. But Milton Prell was not done with Las Vegas. And the years after he retired from the Sahara, Milton Prell realized that retirement was not for him. He envisioned a new hotel on the Las Vegas Strip, one with an Arabian theme that would be called the Aladdin. But that's getting ahead of the story. And that brings us to the Sands Hotel. The Sands, more than any other popular resort, has come to symbolize the Las Vegas of our collective memory. It was here that the color line for entertainers playing at the hotel was finally broken. It was here that Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, and Sammy Davis Jr., and the rest of the Rat Pack held court in the Copa Room. Glamour and glitz, politicos and power mongers all met in the desert, and it helped propel tourism to this small desert oasis 
like no other. Jake Friedman was an oil man from Texas with a penchant for Western attire and pretty girls. And Matt Kupperman was his partner, and they wanted to build a hotel on the burgeoning Las Vegas Strip. They bought the land where LaRue's restaurant stood and set about to build a resort that would cater to both high rollers and the Hollywood glamour crowd. I swear, it was in the water. Friedman hired Las, Vegas, or Los Angeles architecture architect Wayne McAllister, who, had, as you know, designed the El Rancho Vegas to create the resort. Instead of going for a western or southwest motif, as all the other hotels had done, <clears throat> McAllister wanted to bring a mid-century modern look to the Sands Hotel. J.P. Friedman gave him a free hand and did not interfere in the design. The result, according to author Alan Hess, was the most elegant piece of architecture the Strip had ever seen. Jake Friedman brought Jack and Trotta West to work at the Sands as the entertainment director. And Trotta booked the famed Copacabana Room in New York and had ties to most of the talent that traveled the nightclub circuit back then. Known to his friends as Smiling Jack, he was a mountain of a man standing over six foot one. But he knew talent and he knew how to negotiate. Under his leadership, the Sands quickly became known as New York's Copacabana Gone West. Featuring Lena Moore and Noel, Cra Noel Coward, he spirited Marlena Dietrich away from the Sahara. The Sands had deep pockets and was willing to spend top dollar for good performers. Most contracts had a minimum of weeks that had to be played throughout the year, ensuring that the headliners played Las Vegas frequently. As Las, as Las Vegas gained in popularity, gamblers, especially the high rollers, began traveling there instead of gambling in the back rooms of nightclubs anywhere else. The nightclubs across the country soon realized they could not keep pace with Las Vegas paydays. The Sands Hotel opened on December 15, 1952. Danny Thomas, singer-songwriter Jimmy McHugh, and the Copa Girls, the most beautiful girls in the wet, the most beautiful girls in the world, opened the famed Copa Room. Entrada and company were good at promoting the Sands, and it said the hotel made its original 5.5 million investment back in the first six months. Entrada was successful in spiriting away Frank Sinatra from Wilbur Clark's Desert Inn and signed him to play the Copa Room. It was the perfect timing. It was one of those miracles of timing. The right man at the right time in the right place. Sinatra, who just a few years previously had been declared washed up, began his comeback to stardom on the stage at the Copa. He had, by most accounts, a great deal of respect for Jack and Trotta, who had continued to book him back east during his washed-up phase. And Sinatra was always grateful for that. Celebrities, it seemed, seemed loved the Sands. Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, Leo Brenner, Kirk Douglas, Rosalind Russell, Ethel Merman, and Elizabeth Taylor, and more were photographed sitting in King's Row, the prize middle seats in the front of the stage, enjoying the headliners performing on stage in the Copa Room. Nat King Cole was hired to play the Copa Room. Like other African-American performers, Cole had a trailer on the property, but he was not allowed to stay in the hotel. By 1955, Cole was getting a little tired of his trailer. He enjoyed performing at the hotel, but he did not like the segregation policy that forced him to eat in his trailer between shows, and now that he had a family, he, had, he and his family had to drive to the west side each night to stay in a boarding house. He told Entrada if he couldn't stay in the hotel, he wouldn't perform there. Sinatra was performing at the hotel, and by now a close friend of Smiling Jack's, he reminded Entrada that it was a problem not only with Nat King Cole, but for performers like Lena Horn and Sinatra's good friend, Sammy Davis. Sinatra urged Entrada to break the color line. In 1955, with no fanfare, 
and no publicity, and try to quietly allow the headlining African American performers who were performing at the Sands to stay in the hotel. On January 20th, 1958, Jake Friedman died following surgery to repair a blockage in his aorta. The 1950s were coming to an end. The Sands had been responsible for bringing more glamour and more celebrities to Las Vegas than any other hotel. With their powerhouse lineup, they were the hottest hotel in town. Huge changes were in the Sands' future, especially in the 1960s. But before that happened, there was history to be made on the stage of the Copa. In 1960, <coughs> Frank Sinatra's production company, Dorchester Productions, agreed to produce a, a comedy based film called Ocean's Eleven. The story involved a group of World War II vets who robbed five Las Vegas hotels on New Year's Eve. Sinatra suggested filming on location in Las Vegas. Thus, the Sands became the base camp for the cast and crew at the hotel. For three weeks, from January 26th to February 16th, the Rat Pack, as they were known, filmed their scenes during the day, retired to the steam room for a few hours, and then took the stage at the Copa Room for two shows nightly. It was known as the Summit at the Sands, and it quickly became the hottest ticket in town. Audiences were never sure who would be taking the stage each night and if the rest of the Rat Pack would be there as well. And that mystery only added to the excitement. <laughs> the dinner show at 8 o'clock was, was the tamer of the two nightly performances. Though it seemed the boys were ad-libbing their, ad their way through the evening, in reality, Joey Bishop was writing most of the material. The bar part was weak on the stage, and for the next two hours, the audience was never sure of what would happen next. Film footage reveals the five popular entertainers at the top of their game. They had two cards too. After the dinner show, they would have a break and then take the stage for the more raucous late show. Celebrities poured into town to see the three wheeling seltzer spraying shows. It was one of those defining moments in pop culture and the combination of Las Vegas and the Rat Pack was fused into the country's psyche. They would all play the poker room throughout the 1960s as single acts, but the enduring memory remains of all of them on stage during the summit. Howard Hughes had come to Las Vegas on Thanksgiving Eve 1966. And by the end of that year, he had bought the Desert Inn Hotel. On July 22nd, 1967, he his offer to buy the Sands Hotel was accepted. For 15 years, the Sands Hotel had the reputation as the best hotel on the famed Las Vegas Strip. Hotel management had hoped that no one would notice the changes of ownership and the good times would continue. On March 11, 1971, Jack and Trotta passed away. He had become the heart and soul of the hotel after J.P. Friedman's death. The town was stunned. Jack and Trotta was more than a friend, more than a boss. He was like a father to me, and he will be greatly missed, said a grief stricken Sandy Davis Jr. By 1993, a new owner, Sheldon Adelson, announced a series of improvements. Adelson toyed with the idea of bringing the sands back to its original footprint and building a modern resort. Unfortunately, none of the plans for doing that appealed to him. He announced the hotel was closing and would be imploded. The sands officially closed on June 20, 1996. Preservationists and entertainers implored Adelson to save the Cobra Room. They had hoped that he would turn it into a museum, depicting the Sands history and the history of the Strip, but it was not to be. Adelson made a deal with the producers of Con Air, an action adventure movie starring Nicholas Cage, to crash a plane into the casino. 
The film crew made the hotel look like opening day with no <coughs> vault and working slot machines. In August, the asbestos was removed to prepare for the demolition of the hotel. And on November 26, 1996, at 9 p.m., a huge crowd had gathered to watch and began the 10-second countdown. The main, the main power switch was pulled, and the marquee and the tower lights went dark. The demolition began. It was all over rather quickly as the famed Martin Stern Jr. Tower came down to the ground while, while the crowd hooted and yelled. In its place would be a new mega resort with 3,000 rooms, restaurants, shopping, and luxury. The Venetian. But it would never be the same. That's a video where a number of performers that I interviewed talked about how important the Cobra Room was and how important it was to preserve it. And it went out with a thank you for 44 great years. And with that, I give special thanks to the Model Museum, the Nevada State Museum, Las Vegas, Nevada Preservation Foundation, UNLV Special Collections, photographer Bobo Bay, Jeff Burbank, Carrie Burke, writer Pete Hamill, photographer Joel Rosales, Photographer Alan Sandquist, writer George Stamos, and Vintage Vegas for allowing me to use the images that I showed to you today. I apologize once again for the videos not playing, but uh, if you bought the book and the DVD, those videos are included in the DVD. So thank you all. Thank you.